Hey everyone, welcome back. Mad Naturalist Mr. Langers here. We are about to finish unit number one. We've got a couple of things to knock out here. We're going to be looking at how energy moves through an ecosystem. We're going to look at how that causes an ecosystem to organize itself. There are a bunch of ways ecosystems and biomes and living things organize themselves. And by energy is another one. And then we're going to look at the thermodynamics of what makes that happen. But first, let's cover some basics. First thing you have to keep in mind, energy is the currency that runs everything. Just like money runs everything in the real world, unfortunately, energy is that currency in the natural world. And even you and I are bound by that same kind of currency. We have to consume in order to survive. If you don't eat, your body starts eating itself. And then, you know, after that point, if there's nothing left to eat, then that's it. All right. Also, you have to keep in mind that when you eat, when you consume, when anything consumes, you're kind of paying taxes, just like in real world, you're paying taxes on the energy or the income that you're taking in. Most of the energy on Earth's surface is coming from the sun, right? That's most terrestrial, that's all terrestrial biomes, most, subterranean, maybe not. And near surface aquatic biomes rely on the sun to provide most of the energy for everything else. The energy that you get that runs off of you from what you eat that has come from the sun at one point in time. And finally, like I said, life can be organized a bunch of different ways and based on who eats who and how energy flows is yet another way and we're going to look at that as well. All right, let's start by talking about productivity. This is something I've talked about a bunch in this unit, and I've given a basic definition a couple times. But we're going to look a little closer in it this time. And we're looking at what's called primary productivity, or just productivity, depending, that's shorthand. And when we talk about primary productivity, we're talking about plants. Plants are king. Plants are the measurement of how much life there is in a biome, and I've talked about that before. Because without plants, there is no in-between for getting the energy from the sun into your body. You need plants, so plants are the most important thing. But productivity, if you're looking at an official definition, and this is from our friends at College Board, we're looking at the rate at which solar energy is converted into organic compounds through photosynthesis over a unit of time. Yeah, not really useful. In other words, we're looking at the amount of plant matter growing in a particular area over some unit of time. That's all it is. How much plant stuff is growing, how quickly a plant is taking sunlight in, turning it into tissues through photosynthesis and growing. So there's a bunch of different ways you can measure them. If you look here, you'll see that these are some common units for measuring productivity. Now productivity comes in two different forms. We have gross and net. And if you've ever taken in a real paycheck, you'll understand the difference between these two very quickly. If you haven't, you'll find out it's not fun. All right. Primary productivity, we can look at gross, which is the total amount of photosynthesis going on in a given area. All right. Think of this as your income before taxes. And like I said, you pay taxes. To live is paying taxes, basically. The net primary productivity is how much energy is available that is stored after the plant has used it to run its basic uh, functions. So to grow, divide, reproduce, all that kind of stuff. That is the net primary productivity. This is the after taxes. If you don't know what I'm talking about, ask your folks, all right? Ask them what's the difference between their before and after taxes, what that means, and you'll probably get a wince. If you know what I'm talking about, then you'll definitely wince. The after taxes number is never, never as good as the before taxes number. But that's productivity. It's a measurement of how much plant life is growing, and availability of energy. So really, when we talk about productivity, we're talking about net primary productivity because we need the stuff or we use the stuff that is left over after the plants have done its thing. And you also have to keep in mind productivity changes based, therefore, on light availability. So if we're talking about aquatic biomes, only the near surface biomes will get this sunlight to grow and reproduce. Below a certain point, light starts getting diffused out at different wavelengths until finally there is none. And you can't have photosynthesis anymore. And therefore, you have to figure out some other way to get energy, and that's chemosynthesis. Basically like photosynthesis, except you use chemical compounds to draw the energy, not the sun. Taking this information another way, we can look at primary productivity, or net primary productivity, in different biomes. So we'll look at terrestrial first, and as we should expect, the tropical forests 
and the rainforests tend to have the highest biodiversity and because they have the highest productivity and it goes down till finally we get to the desert and you're at the lowest level right so these are terrestrial biomes again near surface you're not talking about like subterranean like a um, cave system that's not that's something separate if we look at aquatic biomes, we can see that this number is even more pronounced. When we look at marshes and swamps and estuaries and things like that, we have way more productivity because now we have a lot more nutrients availability and there's a lot more sunlight. And same thing with coral reefs. And as we go further down to the open ocean, which like I said, when we were talking about aquatic biomes, the open ocean is more or less a desert. There's very little productivity going on. Therefore, you have very little biodiversity. Now, this is something that I find really fascinating. The trophic levels of an ecosystem or a biome and the 10% rule, okay? It's very straightforward and it requires an understanding of the laws of thermodynamics, specifically the first law of thermodynamics. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form to another. So you hear the car going by right now, the energy, chemical energy stored in the gasoline runs through the car, provides kinetic energy as well as sound energy, because we can hear it even though it should be inside and not that loud. And anyway, trophic levels can be divided into a pyramid, and depending on what kind of creature you are, you sit at a different level of the pyramid. And if we start things off, we talk about producers. These are our primary producers. This is the bottom of the pyramid always. The sun, I'm going to make sure this is clear, the sun can never be part of this. The sun is not an organism. Technically, yes. The sun would be the ultimate source of energy at the bottom of here, but we do not include it. If you look and you ever see an example of a trophic pyramid and the bottom level is the sun, it is wrong. Do not, do not do that. So if we're thinking about the 10% rule, what we have to understand is that most of the energy that you and I and any organism cre uh, consumes and takes in is used by that organism to live, to maintain homeostasis. You need it to divide, to make sure your cells divide, to make sure your cells reproduce, to grow, to maintain a balanced temperature, to maintain a temperature if you're warm blooded, right? That means after all that is done approximately 10% of the available energy is available to pass on to the next level. So let's take a look at this, all right? We're at the producer's level and let's say we are at 100% available energy. Now keep in mind, this is net pro primary productivity. So the plants have already used their stuff. So now this is all that's available for this ecosystem. When we move up to the next level, these are the primary consumers. These are the herbivores, cows, sheep, deer, things like that. Now only 10% is available, so they have 10% of the availability at the bottom. All right, this is the second uh, love, trophic level. The secondary uh, level here, secondary consumers, now you have 1% availability. So what did we start at 100? Now we're down to 1. Again, 10%. And this is where you'll find, you know, your first level of consumers. And Depending on the ecosystem you're living in, this could be the end of it. Or you can go one step further into the tertiary consumers. And now you have 0.1% of available energy. This is where you'd find your apex predators, your wolves, your mountain lions, your bald eagles. I think grizzly bear, depending on where you are, is definitely something that should be up here. Now here's a couple of things you have to keep in mind. Right? This is important for understanding, I call this the trophic pyramid. First, if you look over here, if we look, certain things decrease as you go from the bottom of the pyramid to the top. Right off the bat, you have fewer numbers of individuals at each level. And there's a very good reason for that. There's just not enough energy to support equal numbers. So if we had 100 plants at the bottom, we cannot have 100 tertiary consumers. There's just not enough energy available. The 10% rule and laws of thermodynamics dictate that you will have to lose energy as you go further up and you just can't support that many individuals. That's why there's usually so few apex predators in an area, even if it's a healthy population, they just can't have that many. Now, the other thing you have to keep in mind is that biomass also decreases. If you have fewer individuals present, the amount of biomass, which is simply just the mass of biological living things in an area, that's biomass, that is also gonna decrease. Just by mass, there's fewer things as you go higher up, and finally, there is less available energy. So we humans usually live at the tertiary level. 
okay? We consume technically more than most things our size because we are higher on the food or higher on the trophic level, not food chain, not food chain. Okay, and here's one more thing. You will technically four trophic levels is about as much as you'll ever see. You can have a fifth trophic level, which is the quaternary consumer. You can, depends on where you are. But keep in mind, the higher you go, the less energy is available. So you're, the odds of having a lot of individuals at a fifth trophic level are really small. Right? You may have one apex predator, like super apex predator living in an area, and that apex predator has to consume multiple different things in order to survive that long. So producers, primary, secondary, tertiary consumers is about all you'll ever see. You can have a fourth uh, step above quaternary consumers, but you will not have anything more than that. That's really rare and almost impossible. Food chains and food webs. This is something you've been seeing a whole lot since you were like little, and now we're going to look at it again. Some misconceptions I want to make sure we clear up, right? A food chain is a relationship between how energy flows from one organism individual to another, to another, to another in a linear fashion. So if we look here, we started our primary consumers down here. Then we those would be like our phytoplanktons and little microscopic um, uh, algae, right? Then we move on to our primary consumers, our zooplankton or zooplankton. I say zooplankton. Then we move up to something like a secondary consumer. We have like anchovies. Then we move up to a tertiary consumer, like a tuna fish. And finally, again, it's not common, but you can, a quaternary consumer here is like a great white shark. This is a food chain. Now the question I ask, and always make sure that we're clear, is what the arrows represent. And usually students that come to me first, they'll say the arrows represent who eats who. You're not wrong, but the problem is, is when you start throwing decomposers into this, because I've never seen a man-eating toadstool before. Good grief. Anyway, the arrows do not show who eats who. The arrows in a food chain or a food web show how energy moves. So that's how you can go from a great white shark or a lion to a mushroom is because when the quaternary consumer dies, decomposers move in. It's not like you have a giant pill bug come and eat the uh, dead tree. It's just the energy flowing from the dead tree to the pill bug. Now, that's a food chain. Uh, chain. Food webs are much more complex. And you've probably seen examples of this. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is not a true food web. And I'm going to show you what I mean in a second. This is a very simplified food web. But a food web is basically just energy flow again, but multiple food chains interlock and interweaving to each other. So you can have multiple paths from going from one organism to another. It's a map of how energy flows. And again, this is greatly simplified. And I found a really good example of what I mean, and I'm going to show you that right now. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a codfish. If you don't know about codfish, they were one of the first fish commercially hunted in the New World when Europeans showed up. This is where Cape Cod gets its name. It was numbered in the millions and millions. Sailors would say that they could drop buckets over the sides of their ship and just pull them up by the bucket load. They didn't even have to try. The cod fishery has collapsed in the Northeast. It is nothing close to what it was, and that's because we overfished it. But that's a topic for a different day. Anyway, codfish, a very important fish in, the, uh, in whatever waters it occupies. So I'm going to talk about the Northeast, but there's different places it lives too. So let's take a look at this. If you look right here, we have our codfish. It's at the center here. It's important to this whole food web, but it's not a complete food web. We see that we have our primary producers here that go to our primary consumers, our protists and zooplankton, and our krill over here, and that leads to our codfish. So depending on how you look at it, it's either the tertiary consumer or secondary consumer. And then we can see that energy flows up to leopard seal, which are scary, by the way. You should look up leopard seal. They are cool and scary at the same time. And we go from there. So this is a very simplified food web. This food web came from a paper published a few years ago, a scientific paper and a peer-reviewed paper. This is still not a complete food web. Can you imagine trying to memorize this? If you're having trouble, our friend the codfish is chilling right here. 
And this talks about fish like salmon and pollock and tuna and swordfish. And then we get into minke whales and fin whales and pilot whales, harbor porpoises. And then we have gray seals, harp seals, harbor seals, razorbills, puffins. We're not even talking about sharks in this thing yet. And then we go down a little further. We have smelt, we have sand lance, we have owlwives, lobster, shrimp, gastropods. It is crazy. And each line represents energy flowing from the producers to the consumers it gets way more complicated. So if you ever think about complaining about how crazy these food webs are, just know that they get a lot worse and they are a lot worse. But food webs are very complex ways of showing how energy flows through a whole ecosystem. To recap, terrestrial and near surface aquatic biomes get all of their energy from the sun. Other ones are a little different and they have more unique ways of getting their energy sources. Productivity is a measurement of how much solar energy is being converted into plant tissues in a given area over some unit of time. And we have net and gross productivity, and we're really interested in the net productivity because that's what we have available in plants after the plants have done their thing, maintained homeostasis. We can divide a community based into trophic levels based on energy availability and what eats what in an ecosystem. But as we go higher up, because of laws of thermodynamics and things like that, there are fewer individuals available as you go from the first trophic level to the fourth or fifth trophic level, as well as a decrease in biomass and available energy. Things at the top of the trophic pyramid have to eat a lot more in order to live. And that's an important concept which we'll talk about much later. Roughly 10% of the energy, it's an approximate number, goes from available from one level to the next. So if you start at 100, you go down, or you go down to 10, then 1, then 0.1, and so on and so forth. You keep moving that decimal place over. And finally, food chains and food webs show energy flow in different ways. How energy moves from one individual to another. Food chains tend to be much more simplistic. Food webs are multiple chains linked together, and food webs can be crazy complicated. Okay, so that is the end of unit number one. We're going to move on to unit number two next because we go in order here. Uh, until next time, peace.